Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Um, it's run by Digital Frontiers Institute in partnership with GSMA. We're really delighted to be talking to you on the topic of payment service banks, um, PSBs, trying to understand whether they can be commercially sustainable and viable, and also make a con an impact on financial inclusion. We're looking specifically today at Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is a very exciting field right now. Um, there are lots and lots of fintechs in Nigeria, many, many people in Nigeria, um, yet we're still not seeing the kind of penetration in financial inclusion that we would want and hope to have. There are many Nigerians who have remained financially excluded, and it's quite clear that the way things are right now are not going to change that picture anytime soon. So this new revolution, payment service banks, which we're going to learn more about what it is, what it means, or what it, and what it can mean and the impact that it can have, is part of our conversation today. Obviously, we're talking Nigeria, but there are lessons to be learned for other countries in similar situations to Nigeria. So we hope those of you who are joining from Nigeria enjoy listening about developments in your country, and those who are joining from other countries enjoy understanding how this could perhaps impact and improve your ecosystem as well. Um, my name is Sarah Cawley. I'm the Divisional Director at Digital Frontiers Institute, and it's my responsibility to run the webinar series. I'm very delighted um, to have some great panelists with me today who I'm not going to introduce um, uh, everything about them. You can see their, their bios from the LinkedIn profiles that we're going to share with you after the call, but just to do a brief round of introductions for everybody. Um, firstly, I'm joined by Nigam from uh, GSMA. Um, Nigam is going to be um, my co-moderator today, so thank you very much for making my life easier. Um, and Nigam is the um, senior or insights manager in the mobile for development team. We also have another team member from GSMA, um, Lemma, who is the senior market engagement manager for the team as well. So welcome to you both. Thanks. We also have three wonderful panelists who are going to help us unpick what PSVs might mean for financial inclusion and, and its application um, in the real world, how it might reach um, Nigerians in, in their day to day lives. So I'm really, really excited that we have with us today um, Nonso, who is the co-founder of Social Care. We have um, Iola, the co-founder and president of Coolbox Books, and uh, Teo, the founder CEO of Max. And each of them are going to explain a little bit more about their companies and what they do and how um, the PSPs might be able to help and impact their leverage over the call. So without further ado, let me hand over to Nigam. Thank you very much, Sarah. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Sarah, it's an absolute privilege to, to be doing this with you with Digital Frontiers Institute, who has been capacity building in the digital financial inclusion space for you know, a while and really making impact in that space. So yeah, absolutely a pleasure. Um, I am going to, I guess I'll con contextualize a little bit of what's gonna happen um, in terms of the PSB. Um, and then there'll be a presentation from me and Lemma and what we think are kind of key use cases and key partnerships that PSBs can build. But I think the conversation really needs to start with what is a PSB and why are we talking about it? Um, so the payment service bank is, is a new banking uh, license that the CBN, which is the Central Bank of Nigeria, has licensed. Um, the license was sort of approved in 2018, and the first PSBs were launched in 2021. It's a little bit of a unique license. Only India is doing this as well. Um, and India, looking at it, I mean, even though there are differences, it's the closest model that we can learn from. And we can see that there have been some challenges to commercial sustainability, though over time, those challenges seem to be reducing. So the question is, what does the payment service bank bring to the financial inclusion uh, landscape in Nigeria? What can it bring now that we have this category? Um, and maybe what can we learn from this example in India? Um, and if the PSB license is going to be challenging in terms of commercial sustainability, how can partnerships really help other you know, organizations in other sectors kind of leverage the PSB strengths and vice versa to help each other build that commercial sustainability as they advance into rural areas? Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us. 
Um, I think I have given a little bit of a background on this, but yes. So basically Nigeria has had seen quite slow paced financial inclusion. It has budged a little bit, but nowhere near what the financial inclusion targets have been and what we have seen in other places, um, a neighboring Nigeria in the region. Um, since 2018, sorry, uh, the CBN has had a national financial inclusion strategy in place for quite a while. Um, and yes, sorry, and, and introduced the, the, the payments banks license in 2018. Yeah. Contextualizing financial inclusion in Nigeria. In 2020, just over half of Nigerian adults were included and in using formal financial services. Less than 5% had pensions or insurance, which are critical financial products. Financially excluded adults in Nigeria are primarily youth and women. They are primarily rural. They are small business owners and farmers, and they tend to have low literacy. A high percentage live in the Northwest of the country. There are a number of well-known supply and demand side barriers to financial inclusion. These include lack of access to banking points and a lot of these challenges, it is envisioned the PSB will be able to overcome and I'll go into that. So lack of access to banking points, lack of the affordability of services. So for, for a price sensitive customer, the banking charges are challenging. Lack of identity documents. Uh, some research from Afina has showed us that just not enough people have the national identity card or the utility bill or the requirements to sort of meet the, the traditional banking KYC requirements. Um, and also that the products are not really targeted to the needs of your last mile in rural population. So they don't really see the value proposition of switching from cash to digital, to digital finance because it has just not been demonstrated. Um, infrastructure is lacking. Onboarding processes can be quite onerous and bureaucratic. Um, and so all of these kind of stand in the way of it advancing financial inclusion, in particular to rural areas in the way that would be envisioned or. Okay, so with 61% of financially excluded Nigerian adults using mobile phones, digital financial inclusion in Nigeria, of course, offers immense opportunity. Um, CBN has introduced a number of measures before. Uh, this included a mobile money model, but the mobile money model was quite challenging because you could use uh, the infrastructure of the mobile operator, but they could not directly offer any financial services. Um, and so that did not have much uptake. There always has also been the introduction of agent banking. Um, CBN has supported the growth of agents under SANF, uh, the shared agent network, and actually that has seen rapid growth. So there are over 900,000 uh, agents in the SANF network right now across Nigeria. Agent banking, of course, has also had its own challenges, but it is growing, and that does mean that there are more banking access points across the country. Um, even with these measures, rural and vulnerable populations have been difficult to include. And so in 2018, borrowing from India's payments banks playbook, uh, CBN decided, okay, let's introduce this new banking license. The aim is to leverage a combination of physical and digital channels to onboard rural excluded populations and include them in formal financial services. Um, this of course is cost saving because they aren't the traditional brick and mortar structures. KYC is a lot easier. Um, there are now five licensed PSPs in Nigeria. Three got their, li uh, three got their licenses uh, and were three uh, sort of launched around 2021, early 2021. Two just got their full approval a few months ago in April. The two that got their approval uh, recently are MTN and Airtel. So those are big regional um, MNO presences and they have experience of mobile money operations in other markets. Um, and there is therefore a lot of excitement on the entrance into the market of these players and what this could mean for Nigeria. Okay, um, this licensing also suggests that CBN is now considering that telecoms providers are the right type of organization to be delivering digital financial services to the like mile, to the, to the last mile. MNOs have a number of specific advantages in being able to do this. Their wide distribution network for one, their wide subscriber base as well. The experience of delivering mobile money in other uh, markets um, and also the customer trust in their brand. These are some key advantages that, that the mobile uh, you know, operators bring. Um, to digital financial inclusion. However, 
The PSB, as I've mentioned before, has challenges in, uh, built in from the regulatory framework. Um, and these challenges are not negligible. This includes not being able to trade in foreign exchange, except in very limited circumstances, not being able to underwrite insurance, and most importantly, not being able to offer credit directly or in partnership. So given these restrictions, from the get-go, PSPs will need to have a really robust commercial model. It will have to get the split between physical and digital channels to reach people right. It will need the right technology so that uh, its, its users do not end up losing confidence as it kind of go, en enters further into rural um, and unbanked markets. Um, and it needs to figure out the products that really kind of unbanked populations will value. We know from the model uh, that Nigeria is following, that of India, that out of 45 applicants that applied there for a payments bank's license, 11 were granted a license, six survived, and between two and three are profitable after about four years, three to four years in operation. While most of the profit of these successful payments banks does come from transactions, for long-term commercial sustainability, PSBs will need to build win-win partnerships in a range of sectors. These include other players in the financial ecosystem, such as traditional commercial banks, non-bank financial institutions and fintechs, as well as in sectors such as transport, humanitarian payments, government to person, G2P, B2G payments, utilities, and agriculture. A good example of this range is offered by Fino Bank in India. Fino P Payments Bank offers toll collections. Its agents act as banking correspondents for commercial banks. It offers insurance and pensions in partnership with non-bank financial institutions. It acts as a referrer to non-bank financial institutions for loans without actually taking on the risk itself. Fino is recently able to accept international remittances directly into uh, people's wallets. It provides G2P social transfers, and it also offers an open API for over 50 of its commercial partners. It is offering cash management services for companies such as e-commerce solutions. Um, sorry, uh, lost my, yeah, cash management services, digital transport payments, and also conducts outreach for other brands for, such as for KYC. So it serves as quite an interesting example of the range of partnership possibilities for PSPs. The other important thing to note about BSBs and what, and what has happened in that landscape is regulatory evolution. So we have seen that uh, the Reserve Bank of India has doubled the deposit amount that can be held in a PSB account. It has also allowed the, uh, uh, payments banks to apply to become small finance banks um, after three years in operation. And it has also allowed them to change status to a scheduled bank and offer IPOs. Um, so these are some sort of trends that we have seen in India. And you know, it is important to see what happens in Nigeria and whether it will take on board the same sorts of measures. Finally, um, we think in our, uh, in our research with uh, pay-as-you-go solar and utilities companies, and this is um, something my colleague Lemma has really focused on, that partnerships with pay-as-you-go utilities companies and, and solar home systems is a very important use case and partnership between the PSP um, and, and, and these companies. And um, so I will hand over now to Lemma to talk about that particular use case. And it's very exciting that we have with us then a pay-as-you-go solar refrigeration company on the panel that can speak to their experience on the ground to this as well. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna hand over to, to Lemma. Okay, thank you very much, Nigam. Hi, hello everyone. Very good to have you in this webinar. So I'm going to spend about five to six minutes sharing with you our insights on win-win uh, partnerships between, um, uh, you know, payment service providers like, uh, you know, uh, payment service banks and uh, pay-as-you-go enable utility service providers. Um, so uh, in, in, in Nigeria, um, you know, Nigeria is home to the largest off-grid and um, under-electrified population in Africa. So the market for uh, pay as you go, uh, you know, enable services is quite clear. And not, not only, you know, uh, uh, pay as you go solar providers, uh, you know, present in Nigeria, but we also have pay as you go enabled, um, uh, you know, providers in cooling solutions, uh, clean cooking and other models, uh, for example, around water provision through, you know, smart metering 
And um, I think also, you know, around waste management and recycling, we'll start to see these models uh, emerge. So basically, there is a very strong synergy between, uh, you know, payment service banks and utility service providers. On one hand, mobile money services provide the fundamental ingredients for pay-as-you-go services through mobile money. And um, on the other side, pay-as-you-go utility services enhance revenues uh, from mobile money transactions. So the synergy is quite clear. And therefore, training pay-as-you-go service banks agents in pay-as-you-go products could create uh, mutually beneficial uh, partnerships for all stakeholders. Our program has done research um, on the value of pay-as-you-go solar for mobile operators uh, in two instances. Um, the first uh, study was a multi-country and multi-operator initiative that quantified this value for mobile operators and demonstrated the impact it has on consumers and uh, user behavior. Uh, the second study um, explored more on how and why users change their use of mobile services after they have adopted pay as you go solar. Uh, both of these uh, studies are available on our website, whose link I'll share at the end of the presentation. So basically on these graphs, you can see from the yellow line that uh, there was increased frequency of mobile money transactions after a customer has acquired um, you know, pay as you go solar uh, services across all the um, four countries in the study. Uh, the blue line, which is the control group, um, which is the customers that did not adopt uh, pay as you go services, showed that there was, you know, very little or no increase in uh, frequency of transactions. So basically, pay as you go solar is a strong driver of mobile money um, adoption. As to why, looking at the, um, you know, the drivers for increased mobile money usage, uh, some of this includes the fact that you know there are frequent cash-ins by customers because they needed to make deposits to pay daily, you know, weekly, um, or every other few days uh, transactions for their pay-as-you-go service. Customers also gained more confidence in mobile money um, because of the training during the onboarding process for uh, the pay-as-you-go service. So they gained more confidence on the service. Uh, consequently, they also gained more trust because of the repeated use of, you know, mobile money to make payments for their services. And also the fact that they were able to get more services, you know, acquire more appliances linked to their pay as you go solar kits, you know, enable them to do more transactions uh, within the ecosystem. And uh, customers also, you know, gained more uh, higher earnings uh, because they could work more and therefore, uh, you know, they could deposit more money in their wallets. And thus, you know, this enabled them to keep money circulating in the ecosystem. Uh, yeah, again, because they need to pay for, for their services using mobile money. And customers were able to also to discover new services, not just mobile, you know, not just paying for utility uh, services, but other services as well um, that they could, uh, you know, pay uh, using mobile money. Um, so beyond uh, payments, another good area of partnerships Pay as you go uh, services and uh, uh, payment service banks is around uh, go to market strategies, you know, distribution and um, and marketing opportunities or branding opportunities. So basically, uh, PSBs may work more strategically, you know, with some pay as you go partners or all of them by leveraging their brand, agent network, and distribution, and vice versa. So a good example that we can share here is a case study um, on a partnership between Lumos and uh, MTN Nigeria. So basically they partnered to roll out a mobile enabled pay as go service that uh, used airtime credit um, for customers to make payments and GSM based machine to machine connectivity to remotely control and monitor uh, the solar system billing and performance. Um, for this study, MTN's understanding of the local market was instrumental to better address and communicate with customers, you know, while the existing customer base also offered a head start and fast access to the Nigerian market for, for Lumos. Uh, this case study is also available in our website for, uh, you know, deeper uh, review of it. Um, just uh, speaking a little bit about the importance of open APIs and mobile money integration. Um, 
pay as you go services rely on customer trust. So when a customer makes a payment, it's critical that you know the service is fulfilled immediately and the customer is notified you know, through an instant notification of payment that the service has been um, you know, delivered and, and, and their service unlocked. So the importance of uh, uh, you know, uh, mobile money integration between the pay payment service bank system and the provider's uh, systems is quite critical. Uh, the GSMA has done a, quite a bit of work here, including um, you know, a rollout of our um, GSMA IPN hub, now um, Bionic or MFS Africa IPN hub, and also our mobile money API, um, which is a, um, a collaboration with the mobile industry, basically to have a unified specifications of APIs uh, to make these integrations easier. Um, so uh, this is also available and, uh, you know, the payment service banks can adopt the specifications and pass, uh, you know, the specifications along to the, um, uh, you know, startup uh, ecosystem. Um, so uh, this is quite important. And so basically as a startup, uh, it's important to seek out these integrations early. Um, and for the payment service banks, it's very important to make this as seamless and easy to integrate as possible. Uh, finally, uh, our program is uh, committed, you know, to supporting uh, partnerships um, for delivery of uh, essential urban services in energy, water, sanitation, waste management, um, and basically facilitating partnerships between, uh, you know, urban innovators, mobile operators, as well as governments. Please reach out to us um, uh, for these opportunities. Thank you very much. Handing back uh, to Miguel. Great. Thank you, Lema. Thanks very much. And it's really good that you've given that overview of the partnership possibilities and how this works uh, works together. And now we have two, two out of three companies, definitely, although like uh, one is in the transport sector, uh, but the other two are, you know, pay as you go, solar refrigeration and in micro insurance. So it will be really interesting to see what is possible in terms of partnerships um, with the payment service bank, which in other countries is sort of similar to a mobile money um, let me introduce um, our panelists briefly. So we have with us um, Iola, uh, Iola Dominic, who is the co-founder of um, Coolbox. He's a pharmacist uh, and a graduate of, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to not get this right, Obafemi yeah. Awolowo University. I, I, I apologize, Iola, I should have checked with you. Um, and EDHEC Business School, he's worked in sales, marketing, and general management uh, with top multinationals as AstraZeneca, L'Oreal, Robert Walters. Um, and he is very passionate about entrepreneurship and small business. Nonso Opurum is the CEO of SosoCare, which is an insure tech startup based in Nigeria. He is also a social entrepreneur with an obsession with excellent ways to bridge the gap in poor healthcare uh, financing in Africa. Um, he also has co-founded a social media blog, which has over 400,000 followers on uh, development, investigative, and political journalism in Nigeria. And then we have with us um, Adite uh, Aditeo Bamiduro, who is a mobility technology pioneer, smart asset financing entrepreneur, and co-founder at Max. Max is a platform that provides Africans access to electric vehicles and is improving on the current gig economy model. Um, Adoteo is, uh, seeks to build labor justice, provide sustainable living uh, wages and fight unemployment throughout Africa by enabling commercial drivers to finance their motorcycles, tuk-tuks, cars, and minibuses. Um, he is a TED fellow, uh, Endeavor entrepreneur, uh, Techstars founder, MIT alum, Harambee entrepreneur. So lots and lots of just wonderful um, experience and achievements here. Um, I think what would be great is to kick off uh, with a question for um, Iola from the pay as you go solar refrigeration. So um, we've already talked a little bit about the pay as you go opportunities. So I think my first question is, what are your current challenges in reaching customers and delivering your product? Um, whether these are technology, uh, payments or distribution challenges. And linked to that, in what ways do you see opportunities for pay-as-you-go solar refrigeration in partnership with PSPs? How can this be mutually beneficial for, for your business? Uh, is there an opportunity for joint customer onboarding or to partner for distribution, for example? 
Thank you. Yeah, once again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, it's quite a uh, great pleasure to be here. Thanks, uh, um, my co-panelists. And uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, yeah, I'll, go, I'll dive directly into, I'll be mindful of the time. I'll dive directly into the question. So uh, first of all, um, I would like to um, talk about, um, I mean, what we are all about in Coolbox, just to give people the context of what I'm about to talk about. So. Um, so uh, we are uh, poised to make refrigeration affordable and accessible to everyone that needs it. Uh, today, um, we are all about, and we're not just about making boxes, uh, that is making boxes to cool their drinks or to, to cool their food. Uh, we, sell, we see ourselves a bit more than that, even though we do that better than a lot of companies. Um, today, we see ourselves, we believe that uh, every individual or every small business uh, should be able to make uh, a living or livelihood through um, a natural resource, which is um, energy from the sun, wind, or, or and, and that's what we're here for. And uh, over the years, we've empowered, um, last three years, over 2,000 uh, small businesses. And uh, we figured out that 90% of those businesses basically are in off-grid areas where you don't have that. And what that tells us inadvertently is the kind of opportunity that exists in these areas if only we have, or they have access to payment platforms to be able to access a product that will enable them to feel their families. So um, I'm really excited once again to be here. And that's one of the challenges we're having because of course, uh, most of our customers or our potential customers who should uh, be using our products are actually in areas where they do not have access to power. And of course, there are no banking infrastructure. Um, the, the second challenge uh, we also foresee basically is, the, is in the in collection. Um, um, a lot of times uh, having to uh, go on canals, having to go because most of them are in riverine areas. Um, and from your statistics, you could actually see that most of the people that are excluded, they are women, farmers, fish uh, traders. And these are the type of people we serve because they have to keep value in their fridges and they have to keep value in their freezers from natural sun. So we figure out that uh, having payment platforms that would enable easy collection, is of huge value and of huge extent to Coolbox that we don't really have today. And thirdly, uh, it's in KYC, you know. Uh, so what we also observed over time is having to do KYCs in these regions are not usually very easy, particularly looking at the type of people we deal with, no technological infrastructure, no data. But if we had PSBs who have data, obviously it would be easier for us to know who exactly we can give our phrases to. They're not cheap. Uh, therefore, uh, productive use um, um, uses. So clearly, uh, they're not cheap products. And lastly, uh, a very big challenge we're facing today is also identifying um, customers that are paid. So we have customers spread all over the place, but because uh, we cannot identify them individually, the only way we are able to identify them today is through the units, which is the phrases that are given. Um, if we had other means like uh, perhaps wallets, which would be easy uh, for us to identify, perhaps it would be easy to identify who pays. So you figure out that when a customer pays, they forget to quote the reference of their units and it becomes difficult for us to match the payment with the customer. These are things that we feel that with a PSP, I mean, it would be easy, it would, it would be very natural. So those are the challenges we're facing. And um, uh, we see a whole lot of opportunity if all this uh, uh, can be addressed through uh, the PSBs or the data they offer. Um, and going into the opportunities that we see, uh, first of all, um, we see a massive opportunity with ability to access data or NS data uh, from these PSBs if they do exist. Uh, we feel this data will help us reduce uh, the, the stress that we go through when it comes to KYC, knowing your customers who to give our products to, that's number one. Secondly, we also see a massive opportunity in distribution. Uh, we're glad that we have two uh, big um, uh, multinational uh, telcos that have been given the license. If we're able to access data, access their distribution network, access their, data, their agent network, we believe that this would um, be play a huge, um, a huge um, effort in ensuring that uh, small businesses have access to refrigeration as is required to make a livelihood for them. So uh, I don't know, but that's um, a brief of um, um, the challenges. If you have uh, questions regarding that, I'll be more than happy to, to flesh it up, yeah. 
Thank you. That was great. That was really comprehensive. And it sounds very much like a, a, a PSB that, that gets far and gets into those rural areas could really be helpful for your business model. It could solve a lot of challenges. Um, I do have a question. I know Sarah's supposed to get hers in. I'm just going to get mine in. Sure. And <laughs> I'm shooting a bit. Um, have you talked to them yet? Have you, ha have you had those initial yeah. partnership conversations? Because I know it's, it's still early days. And then um, I stop and hand to Sarah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm very excited to tell you that, yes, we're uh, one of the very, in fact, the biggest uh, mobile operator in Nigeria that contacted us. Uh, so they would like to work with us uh, on not just uh, the payment platform, but also providing Wi-Fi in these rural areas through our units where they can be used as spots uh, for Wi-Fi for the village or for the environments in which we are in. Uh, we've recorded a huge um, growth. Uh, what we did last year, we've done it only in two months. Uh, this year. So um, that shows you the kind of opportunity that exists in Pago Refrigeration. Um, so yes, uh, for telcos, yes, we're already engaging uh, some of those that have those licenses. And we're happy to tell you that the next couple of weeks we'll be launching a pilot with about 10 of our customers in those regions. And uh, we see this as an opportunity that will open up a lot of um, 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 other opportunities for, uh, for growth in this region. Yeah. Actually, you, you managed to ask, answer one of my questions, which was going to be because obviously we know that partnerships work when both parties benefit. And I was going to say to you, you know, what is the, what are you going to be offering to the PSBs? And obviously, one of those things will be, the, you know, these Wi-Fi uh, hotspots that you mentioned. Um, is there anything else, Aola, that, you, you know, you feel that you are in a unique position to offer back to the PSB? Yeah, um, today, connectivity. Uh, most of those regions where we'll be reaching, perhaps uh, uh, they're not present there or they don't have access to those people. Uh, we're talking of river and areas that uh, most likely uh, would need a refrigerator, uh, places that usually are not easily accessible. Uh, and these are areas where you trade with fish, you have farmers, you have, and these are people that would be needing a refrigerator. So in terms of connectivity, uh, we see a huge opportunity for them as well. and. And when in terms of reach, uh, we're the only ones doing what we do currently, uh, I would say globally at the moment, pay as you go solar refrigeration, embedded. Uh, so uh, we're talking to uh, even Senegal, one of the biggest uh, mobile communication in Senegal as well, the biggest mobile communication in Ivory Coast and in Congo. Uh, we're running pilots with them at the same time. So I'm pretty excited about the space and uh, yeah, we look forward to more opportunities. Yeah. Wonderful. And I mean, I, I guess this is, a, to coin a phrase, the future looks bright in terms of harnessing that solar energy, but also reaching more people with financial and, and helping them, you know, build their financial inclusion, their financial resilience through Correct. being able to store food, store products, exactly. um, health exactly. healthcare as well, I'm assuming as well, can also use your... Exactly. For as little as $10, thanks to pay as you go, you can actually have a, a solar refrigerator relying just on the energy of the sun. I mean, why pay for electricity when the sun is free? Yeah. And more environmentally friendly as well, which is obviously yeah. another, another key thing that we, we will be talking Thank about you. green finance yeah. as yeah. time goes on. That sounds yeah. fabulous. I'm really excited to, to, to hear about the, the potential growth that you've got there, both within the PSB, but also obviously across the region um, as well. Um, I'll hand back to you, Nigam. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you so much, Ayola. That was, that was great. And um, if we can talk now maybe to Nonso. Um, so Nonso, you've also got a really innovative, um, really interesting product and really a relevant one because um, as far as the statistics show, the micro insurance, like Nigerians just don't have insurance. Um, and, you know, that is, you know, particularly important, especially if you're vulnerable. And um, you've got a model where you can, you know, um, people can kind of trade waste to sort of buy insurance um, in a sense. And I'll let you explain that better. But um, with you, it would also be really interesting to understand what are the current sort of, so how do you, how does the insurance process work right now? Who do you partner with in terms of a non-bank financial institution to provide this? Um, what are the challenges of that? And would a partnership with PSBs be helpful um, in delivering insurance or expanding your reach? Thank you very much uh, for your question. You know, uh, let me try to phrase and talk about what we do. My name is Nonso, like rightly said, and I'm the uh, associate here. Uh, the, just, okay, our simple mission is to ensure that 
everyone can have access to quality health care irrespective of their socioeconomic condition. But one of the one of the interesting things and why we started social care was I, I started my career working in the micro pension informal sector, trying to serve the informal sector. One of the interesting things I learned with that period was that people practically don't trust insurance. It wasn't a priority to them, they don't need it. Trust was a very huge problem. Awareness again was a problem. For a low income person, they do have to struggle to eat three square meal a day. Insurance wasn't a priority to them, but you see them moving back into poverty because they don't have safety net. So a good example was in Northern Nigeria, we had this man that was using our policy. One day, he was also our agent. One day he went to bed and he didn't wake up. You know, he had a homestead wife. So obviously to us, he was likely to move back into poverty. So one of the things we learned then was how can we also create a uh, life insurance services to ensure that people like this can have safety net in case that something unexpected happened. So for us, one of the biggest challenges that we had trying to distribute insurance to low-income people is how we can be able to ensure transparency. Insurance requires a level of trust. Insurance requires awareness. A low-income person gives you three, three kilograms of plastic. He wants to instantly check every five minutes to ensure that there is a place where this data is. He can instantly see that I have saved up let's say a dollar or two over a period of time is in my wealth. How can I be able to withdraw this? Okay, I don't just want insurance alone. I want to use a portion of that for insurance and withdraw some part of that to possibly buy food or bread or other things. So that was practical experience that we had over time when we reached out to one of the technology providing banks in Nigeria, Women Bank, who has opened up to give us a wallet system that can allow low-income people to that save uh, in the wallet and be able to use the, those deposits to offer other services that they want beside insurance. If it, we, we, the conversation has been how can we ensure that possibly the user can decide how he wants to pay. Either I want to pay 30% of this and withdraw that as cash, or I want you to charge me by the end of the month. But the interesting thing about the PSB and, uh, and telecom providers that they have got this level of uh, trust. I know that I bought a, a, a recharge card. It's going to be there for me. I have data, one GB. I can always use it to check Facebook and other things. So they have that level of trust that we build. They have a distribution network. Working with PSB will ensure that we can be able to distribute our policy. You know, it can create a level of efficiency for us as a business. In, uh, because now for us, data collection is a problem. Like Dominic rightly mentioned, when you want to collect data, there are people in communities that are disconnected. They don't have smartphones. How can they be this? How can we easily onboard people like this? We face huge problems because we have to collect pictures and other things which are required to, go to for the writer to not carry the risk. So, but when we have, uh, you know, this this like when we work with telecom providers and this PSB license, it takes out that which process because already these data are there. So it makes it easy to type a few couple of codes, maybe simple USSD code, and you can instantly onboard these people, which is more that way you can, you can instantly distribute policy to low income people. One of the interesting things that we we'll have learned over time is that when people instantly use healthcare for the first time, you know, they never go back. You see. You see, we, we have more of a churn with people who pay cash. I pay cash this month, I don't use a policy. Why am I going to come back? I'm a low income person, I have need for other things. I give you trash, it costs me nothing. Either I pay cash, I don't pay, or I don't use it this month, and I will always generate waste. It costs nothing. So it established that level of trust between the providers and, uh, and companies, uh, startup companies like us. So one of the interesting things that we look up to do with the PSB, with this, this license that we are excited about what we for us, it could help us to, you know, create that level of financial inclusion, allow low-income people who, who with, with uh, Wema Bank, we've been able to create a type of bank account for low-income people. Someone wants to save money from his proceeds of waste, but he doesn't have bank accounts. So it takes us back again to another work. How can we ensure that these people can save and we can withdraw it? So it was a lot of work for us that we realized that the best way is to come up with a wallet system that can allow these people to save these things into their simple wallet. They can type a few code and see it anytime and can instantly withdraw it. That trust can be established. So I think recycling uh, requires a level of behavioral change. People don't recycle for convenience. They don't want to walk long distance to recycle. They think it's hard work. But if there are values that, you know, that can put the value at where the job of recycling, you see them, they want to do it for the benefit of themselves. But the middle class person may not really want to recycle for the income, but if there are persuasive or compelling messages that can compare him to give his waste to ensure a low income person somewhere can have insurance, he may be able to put it in his wallet and 
that. I, again, I think this life, this case uh, will require a level of adoption and people to uh, take it and utilize it. We had a case I was doing in India, you know, with one of our board on how mobile wallet systems have worked on insurance payments in India. One of the interesting things that we learned there was initially it was a bit difficult for people to use, but after some time they started using it when there was this level of trust. So with uh, this PSB license, one of the things we believe it can do is it can create that level of change and adoption to low-income people. They cannot just use this for the recycling of their waste. Those plastics or whatever value they can get can use for maybe uh, getting rich card or other things that which is based on their work, which is more of an incentive for them that can drive uh, the utilization of this PSB license, uh, PSB wallet for to ensure that low-income people can have healthcare and uh, telecom providers can be able to also well use the services to reach more. Thank you so much. So uh, is, if I've got this right, so for you, it's drive adoption um, and fundamentally it's trust. It's also the fact that the data can be utilized uh, to make better decisions and um, and yeah, so have I, have I, have I in, got that right? There was a little bit of echo when you were speaking, so. Perfect, yes. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. And so I'm going to ask you, Nonso, you know, what, how, how will PSB, how will you contribute to a PSB? What will you offer them? Why would a PSB want to partner um, with you on this project? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, the thing is about adoption and new product is that uh, for low, there's this huge level of trust with new product. But with telecom providers, it's easy to distribute. You know, they launch new things that people can adopt. But even at that, there are different in in ways you can incentivize people to adopt a new product. This product is new. I'm not, I don't know how it works. I don't have a bank account. Okay. Like with the bank we are partnering with, the bank is willing to give insurance. All you need to do is put up two pieces of plastic in your wallet. The bank will pay for your first month insurance. So that's where they, they want to you know, create adoption of the wallet system for, for the bank. So I believe that this can as well go a long way to ensure distribution and utilization of the light of the PSB wallet system for the telcos. Ensure that look, more people can use this. It could be when you use this service to so get drop a kilo of plastic, maybe your first data for the month can be free. You can get to hundred naira touch card. That way you see more adoption for, for people who use this service. That's really interesting. So sort of helping people and you know give them a reason, to, you know, like a like a freebie to get them to sign up and, and what you're kind of convinced that once they sign up, then they'll see all the other benefits. They'll be able to pay pay and go solar and then you know for our next speaker also pay their transport. Um, you know, once you once you sign up, you begin to see all the advantages and you know that that's really 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 important. I think you know I think that's a great contribution that you'd be adding there. Thanks, Sarah. Nigam, back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Nonso. I mean, we've had we have like not so much time and lots more, so much more to talk about. Okay, I'm gonna ask my next question. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, on uh, transport and the transport sector. So we we know that mass transit in Nigeria is a multi-billion naira industry, but payments are primarily cash based. Aditya, I know you, you, you're not sort of playing in the public transport space, but one of my questions to you is, do you see any kind of uh, momentum in the digitalization of transport payments, where, uh, which, might, which would be a space that payment service banks you think could play in, or, or does that look like that's something that will come much later on? Uh, what's the trend in terms of digitizing public um, transport payments? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a great question. So to your point yes we, we do not play in the in the public transport space uh, uh, in the traditional way people think about mm. you know government backed public transportation but we play in in the vehicle finance space right and um, you know 90 over 95% of transportation in 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 Nigeria and for the most for most parts of Africa are private powered anyway so mm -hmm. so we play, we still play a very critical role in enabling transportation for everyday people across both mobility and logistics. Um, across you know, Nigeria alone, there's about eight to 10 million people who are independent commercial drivers. And that includes the two-wheel operators, the, the tuk-tuk operators, and also the minibus operators as well, as, as well as the taxi operators. So it's a huge number, right? Mm. And uh, you know, close to 18 million adults uh, across Nigeria rely on those people to move around. 
every single day. But today, over 99% of the payments that are made in public transport across Nigeria are cash-based payments, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a huge opportunity to move all of these payments away from inefficient cash payments to, uh, you know, digital payments, right? Um, the industry across the continent, we've estimated it, uh, you know, if you include consumer mobility payments, vehicle finance, vehicle sales, uh, electric vehicles and battery swaps, uh, and all the other services that, that commercial drivers need and require, including their tax payments to regulatory authorities, all of that is, we've estimated it to be close to over $50 billion, right? So it's huge, and it's growing at 4.4% per annum. So it's a huge, huge, huge industry, in, industry right? Hmm. But there's a bunch of challenges, uh, you know, that explain why this industry hasn't really taken off the way it should, at least in terms of digitizing payments and shifting all of these transactions away from cash payments to digital payments. Some of these challenges include things like, you know, uh, lack of, you know, centralized ID systems, right? Yeah. So, you know, financial intermediaries would not participate in this industry. They feel like, or if the fact it remains that, you know, they, they don't know who they're dealing with, right? Yeah. So if you look at Nigeria, for example, uh, you know, there's been some initiatives around BVNs and also NIN registrations, but, but these two uh, have, have not seen any penetration close to what we have with mobile subscriptions, right? So it still means that a big chunk of potential participants in the industry who want to you know, adopt digital financial services still can't because the only thing they have is a mobile phone, right? Or a, a mobile number. They don't have an NIN number. They don't have a BVN number, right? Uh, the other challenges that we face, for example, in our business is the fact that also, you know, we are operating way below our vehicle financing and vehicle deployment uh, capacity. Uh, and a big driver of this, of course, is also, you know, the, the challenge with verifying the identities of the prospective independent drivers who want to access vehicle financing on our platform. So for example, today we have the capacity to deploy up to 5,000 new vehicles every month, but we're doing somewhere between one to 2,000 because of the onerous processes involved in actually checking the identities of these drivers and all of that, and you know, making sure they have guarantors. All of this would instantly go away the moment we have, uh, the moment all of these guys are onboarded onto, onto PSBs with their digital wallets. Um, there's also challenges around the, the payment experience as well. So you made the point earlier that we have over 900,000 agency, ag uh, ag agency banking providers across the country, which is great. And that's a big step from where we were before. But still, you know, for a driver to make their subscription payments today, they still have to find the closest uh, agency, you know, uh, agent, agent, agent banking associate, right? Um, if, if they could make this payment directly from their mobile phones, then this would completely transform the experience and further drive penetration. And then last but not least is the fact that, uh, so to date, we've mobilized through our partners, including OEMs and some banks that we have on our platform, uh, close to about $100 million, right, in, in funding for vehicles. But it's, it's less than 30% of that money has come from institutional providers of capital, including banks and the capital markets. And the reason for that small percentage is that the banks still do not have sufficient confidence in deploying capital into this industry because most of the payment flows are still cash-based, right? And they can't track or trace them. And therefore, they're still not as confident to be able to deploy the sort of capital that they have available, but they're too afraid to deploy it because of the lack of uh, transparency in the payments that happen in this industry today. So what are the opportunities, right? You know, Number one is, of course, digitized payment flows all the way from custom commuters directly to the drivers and the providers of transportation and all the way to the providers of capital like the banks, right? So digitizing that flow end to end would completely unlock a new wave of opportunities in the space. The second is uh, there's an, an opportunity to also accelerate a digital savings culture, right? So a ton of the commercial drivers today are making money, but they're not, they're not saving enough, right? And therefore, when they have emergencies, they have no money to, to, to meet those emergencies because it's very hard for them to save if a, lot, a ton of their money is coming via cash payments. Uh, there's also other things like, like uh, Ajoy, that's the word we use in Nigeria to represent group, group savings. There's a huge group save, informal group savings culture that we have here in the transport industry in Nigeria. Uh, PSBs can completely transform that experience and take it to the next level. There's insurance as well. We already talked about insurance. Um, there's the opportunity to create credit profiles 
for commercial drivers, which they can then leverage to access other credit products. There's of course digital ID problem as well, uh, with you know uh, uh, with PSBs coming on board and de delivering wallets to tens of millions of, of commercial drivers across the space and commuters as well. You know th those could also double as digital IDs that could then be leveraged. You know uh, 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 for KYC uh, uh, use cases. Um, you know so so that commuters and drivers can access financial services much much quicker. Uh, there's also a wide range of other credit and lending opportunities that. PSBs can enable, right, uh, uh, for the in, in this space. And then, of course, not to talk of the, the security benefits that come from eliminating cash payments, right? Uh, this would enable uh, commercial drivers to be able to operate even with much more, much higher confidence and knowing that, you know, they're carrying a lot less cash and, and have a lot less to worry about. And then last but not least, of course, is the huge cost savings that would come from are uh, taking out non-value adding intermediaries in the mobility space, right? And you have a ton of them. Uh, PSBs can help, you know, uh, deliver, connect vendors directly to commercial drivers and take out all the non-value adding, uh, non adding intermediaries and therefore lower the cost of lending, the cost of services and all the other uh, 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 benefits that, that commercial drivers are looking to access. So there's, there's huge opportunities here, right? You know, to completely digitize the, the transport industry uh, all the way from commuters to transport operators and providers to financial services providers. Thank you so much. That's great. It's really, really helpful. What do you think is the first step? And do you see partnership opportunities for your own business? Because I think what I understand is you need kind of, you need the PSB to kind of intervene at all of these levels. So the whole chain is kind of digitized and then the intermediaries are gone and the KYC is there and the credit checks are much easier and you can onboard and you can encourage uh, drivers to save and to, you know, to all of like, it's almost like an ecosystem thing directly from max is, is the PSB kind of, uh, you know, is, is there a direct partnership opportunities for your business firstly? And secondly, in terms of beginning to digitalize this whole chain, what do you think are the initial steps that the, you know, that PSBs should be taking or could be taking to get that process started? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're definitely looking to partner with the PSBs. Uh, so far, you know, we, we've worked very closely with some of the agency banking platforms are to be able to provide digital wallets to the drivers and the commuters that we serve, right? But in terms of the, the distribution that these guys have, it's nowhere close to what the PSBs could do, deliver in terms of their potential, their distribution, and their penetration in the market, right? So we're definitely, you know, very excited about uh, partnering with them to onboard thousands more tens of thousands more drivers and provide them access to our vehicle subscription product and also the, the other products that we deliver alongside vehicle subscriptions, including things like insurance and healthcare and, and even government tax payments as well, right? So we are, we are very keen to, to work with them. In terms of quick wins here, yeah, I think, um, you know, onboarding as many transport operators as possible, right? To be able to have wallets, and be able to do seamless transfers is kind of like the first step here, because once they start transacting or uh, using that using use, use, using these wallets, then there's an unlimited amount of products and use cases that we can build on top of those rails, right? So I would say onboarding tens of millions of drivers, targeting a product specifically for the transportation and mobility space is sort of like uh, a, a great starting point here. Great, thank you so much. That was such meaty content. That was all great to hear, Sarah. I think we will not have time for Q&A and we have three minutes. I know, I'm just thinking we've, we've had such a wonderful conversation and I think we've covered a lot of the questions that have come in anyway. Oh, okay. um, and there's just, I think, a one that, that I, I'm gonna just quickly ask to you, um, Nigamo or Lemma. Um, and I think it's interesting from, from Joseph. Um, are are um, PSBs allowed to um, give incentives to customers like interest on the money deposited in their accounts? Um, that's an interesting one there that I thought would be worth asking. Do we know the answer to that in Nigeria? Um, interest on deposits, that's a good one. I will look it up and go back. Mm. I should know it now, but uh, <laughs> um, I, so I don't think they can have um, savings. Uh, oh yes, they are. Someone says yes, they are, but I have to check. There we go. Well, we're, we're, we're looking to that. it off the top of my head. So, but I think you know that that's it's an interesting um, 
you know, it, it certainly has been a challenge in some mobile money providers that, that the customers have not been able yeah. to earn interest. So, so it'll be interesting my to see whether you couldn't. My sense is you couldn't, but but clearly yeah. we, I need to check. We'll, we'll, we'll check into the the, 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 the legalities. The, the regulatory, that. yes. But I mean, I found today's conversation really fascinating. I was thinking, you know, about the, you know, the, the, the husband and wife living in a rural area. Maybe the wife is a farmer, the husband is a taxi driver. And how, you know, all three of our speakers today could be offering products, um, you know, at, at their products much easier um, to those that, to that couple, you know, if if we had, you know, good wallets, you know, they could be paying, you know, for their refrigeration, they could be earning their money and income, you know, through the taxi driving could be getting um, micro insurance to cover their health needs. Um, and yet normally the three of you would would not know each other would not be on the page, same panel discussion but yet if partnering with a PSB could actually make all of your services available to each other's customers increasing the distribution phenomenally right and incre in, in, increasing the opportunity for financial inclusion for you know not, you know the average Nigerian you know immensely um, there's clearly a fantastic opportunity here we've talked you know I, I've he heard you all talking about you know, easing of collection of, of money, whether that's for insurance, whether that's to pay uh, transport itself or the loan for your vehicle, whether that's to pay for pay, you know, paying those solar, you know, identification of customers will become much easier, access to data and information, wider distribution networks. All of you have said, you know, very similar stories, but, in, you know, in application, slightly different ways. And it's really clear that there is a key role for, for PSBs to play in Nigeria and for, for you also to play in their success too as, as partners, that kind of having um, synthesis between, um, you know, users and, and merchants and, you know, uh, use cases and PSBs is going to obviously be clearly very important for its success. We will watch this space closely. I hope maybe we'll be having a, a second conversation that maybe in a couple of years to follow up and, and assess where we are and assess the learnings from Nigeria. Um, but for now, I will say thank you very much to our audience for listening and for our panelists for joining us today and for Negan for co-moderating with me. I've really enjoyed myself. I hope you have too. And I look forward to seeing you all on a webinar soon. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.